Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were, uh, we had a meeting in Europe, in Austria. And so we took uh, uh, just the chance while we were there to visit the city of Salzburg, uh, which we had never been to, uh, never been to the country before uh, of Austria. And, um, you know, Salzburg is under the shadow of this big castle up on a cliff above it. Uh, fortress, they call it. And it was ruled by prince archbishops, um, which I was like, surely there is a something, uh, there's a mistake here in what they're describing the, the ruler to be. But no, he was both the, the, the political ruler as well as the, the leader of the church of Salzburg. Um, and yet he reigned from this fortress up above the city um, and quick to squash the people when they got out of line. And, and the problem is political power and the gospel do not mix. It was clear, we, I visited the primary residence of the Prince Archbishop, you know, now turned into a museum. And there were these opulent rooms. Um, we can show that slide now. Um, rooms that uh, every room had paintings up on the ceilings with dramatic scenes. Now, again, I remind you, this was the leader of the church of Salzburg, but these dramatic scenes were not from the Bible. Uh, they couldn't be because he was trying to back up his earthly power with these, these scenes, uh, he needed to use political power. And so he, they, all of the scenes were from Alexander the Great. Every room, it was tracing the story of Alexander the Great. Someone who did not fear God and was a conqueror that conquered with cruelty uh, interesting, later, one of the prince archbishops, he created these like trick fountains. He's kind of an unusual guy. Um, but what he, he did this one thing with a, see this crown up in the, it's suspended by water. And the point of this, this is a metal crown that water is pushing up. But the point of that is that your power rises and falls at a moment's notice. So even the Prince Archbishop recognized that this political power was in the end, folly. This morning, we are returning back to the book of Isaiah or Isaiah, whatever you prefer to know it as. We've been in first John the last few weeks. Before that, we were in the first 12 chapters of Isaiah, and now we're picking up where we left off. So we will start in Isaiah 13. Now, these are, these are not chapters that are frequently read or preached on, and they're a, they're a little difficult, honestly. Um, but the reason that we want to focus on them is they are in God's word. And so we want to spend some time in them, but I'm just gonna warn you, it, this may not be like, you may not come out of the service skipping and, you know, uh, it, it's some heavy subject matter. Let's just put it that way. So the first 12 chapters of Isaiah, the focus is really on, on Judah and Jerusalem. Isaiah has been given this vision to speak to his people and really giving them pretty strong warnings to trust in God and not trust in anything else. Even though Judah is facing 
this oncoming assault from the Assyrian Empire, that there's a temptation to make some deals and try to get out of it that way. And Isaiah says, no, trust God. <clears throat> now, in these chapters, chapters 13 to 23, Isaiah now gives the focus to the nations. He's moving out of just Judah and Jerusalem to the nations around him. And there's several reasons for that. Um, but really, I mean, ultimately what we see here is a move from Jerusalem and Judah to the nations around him, uh, a message that this is of universal application. Now, these are difficult chapters for a number of reasons. They have place names that we do not recognize. They don't, you wouldn't find them as quickly on our uh, 21st century maps. It uses 7th century BC Hebrew poetry, which is just not, it's not the way we commonly speak today. It's not written in the style of a, a letter like some of the New Testament is, which has some really easy to understand uh, things for us to do. And so it may, it may be harder to read. And so one of the reasons we want to spend some time in this is to, we, we believe all of this is God's word and to be able to, as you're reading it, my, my prayer is that you're able to have better understanding as you read it. So why do we study these chapters? I created a top 10 list, okay? I'm gonna try to convince you. If you're not convinced, come talk to me. I'll try again. Uh, reason number one, God is God of all nations, all peoples. And so the, the message uh, of Isaiah is not just, doesn't just apply to Judah and Jerusalem. It applies to all nations. All peoples are to bow before the God of all creation. Number two, therefore, all nations answer to God and will come under his judgment. we will all answer to God. Uh, number three, all scripture is given to us by God. Who are we to ignore some of it or part of it? So uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. Number four, these chapters reveal a lot about human nature. And that even goes across cultures. And we are a, a congregation of many different cultures, which is an incredible thing. And what I'm saying here is that this does not just apply to one culture or another, this applies universally. Number five, these chapters reveal a lot about God's nature. He is holy, yet loving those of us who wander. He is our judge, yet saving those of us who rebel. He is sovereign and yet concerned for each and every one of us. Number six, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall but God remains forever. Number seven, our greatest worldly achievements can disappear in an instant. Just like that crown can go high and the next moment it can go low. Number eight, God is sovereign over all of history. Number nine, God's redemptive work is universal. So it's not just that the warnings are universal, that God's offer of redemption 
is universal. And number 10, we get to learn a lot of place names from 2,500 years ago in the Middle East. I know you're excited about that. Geography, where it matters even less. <laughs> One, one scholar says this, he says, we must trust either in the nations or in God, and no book on earth will ever make the case for trusting God more forcefully than Isaiah. So this morning, we're going to look at this in four parts. Babylon in the Bible, Babylon in our world today, Babylon in us, and where do we find refuge? This morning, we're going to be in chapters 13 and 14. We're not going to go through it in order. I will just refer to, to bits of it and read parts of it. Um, there are some long chapters. And again, it's, um, it's, it's a little complicated to teach through. And there are some ideas in here I'm going to point out along the way that we just try to understand, partly so that as you're reading the Bible, that you have my hope, my prayer is that you have better understanding what you're reading. Babylon in the Bible. Chapter 13, verse 1 says, this is an oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. From chapters 13 to 23, Isaiah addresses 13 different nations, confronting them with their failures and warning them of coming judgment. Um, and Isaiah begins with Babylon. Why does he begin with Babylon? Babylon was not the first on the stage. Actually, when Isaiah wrote this, Babylon was not yet in power. So why does he begin with Babylon? Well, from Genesis to Revelation, Babylon serves as a symbol of the city of man's making. It represents the ambitions of humanity human ingenuity and innovation, but also human pride and greed. I, I want to let you in on a little secret. Uh, in, uh, at least in the English Bible, I don't know about other translations of the Bible. But in Genesis 11, it talks about the city of Babel. In Hebrew, Babylon and Babel are the exact same word. So when it talks about Babylon, it's also, it's Babel. And when it talks about Babel, it is Babylon. So Genesis 11 then, it says this in verse four. It says, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Do you see what they're doing? Why are they trying to build this tower? To make a name for themselves. It's not so different from today. Yesterday, I was visiting, uh, I had some visiting pastors from the US and we went to the 86th floor of the Twin Towers. I've never been up there. Um, in fact, I don't know if I've, ever been so high uh, in a building before. It's not something I want to do a lot. I don't like heights. I imagine that the builders of the Tower of Babel, I mean, they had no comprehension of this kind of height. Yet one of the pastors said, you know, I wonder if it's the same motivation going on. The desire to make a name for ourselves. It remains as true as ever. As it goes in Babylon, so it goes in KL. Three different surveys of teenagers done in America and England in the last two years asked what they wanted to do when they grew up. All three surveys came up with the same number one result. Can you guess what that is? <laughs> But how do you get rich and famous? Yes. YouTube or social media influencer was number one. 
When I was a kid, we had, we were simpler days. Firemen, policemen, something along those lines. The ambitious ones wanted to be astronauts. I was not one of those. <laughs> But I mean, it's fascinating, uh, this phenomenon um, for, you know, at its base to be an influencer is ultimately to make a name for yourself. For the influencer and those who are influenced by them, it's a phenomenon where we allow total strangers to speak into our lives, all because they have a clever, ability to make a video or have some pithy one-liners or something. But so we're allowing people to shape our thinking just because they're clever or they're stylish or whatever it may be. And when we do that, we're actually lowering our ability to hear from the divine, to hear from God himself, who is really the only truly worthy influencer. We see Babylon mentioned again at the end of the Bible. So we were started in Genesis and then all the way to Revelation, describing God's final judgment. Babylon is again mentioned. This is long after the collapse of the Babylonian empire. The Persians, the Greeks, the Romans had all risen to power since then. And still Babylon is used because it stands as a symbol throughout the Bible of human ambition. Let's read from Revelation chapter 18. It says this in verses 2 and 3. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for unclean, for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. This is the, the symbolic Babylon that still exists today. We can see from this passage that Babylon is not just one city it actually represents humanity without God. Returning back to Isaiah 13, we see Babylon put into focus and just given clear judgment pronounced over it. Let's look at 13 verse 9, 19 for a second. It says this, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. What is clear from the biblical passages about Babylon is that it represents a city that has been disobedient. But more than that, it represents people who made choices that were defiant against God. I, I, some notes of explanation are, are going to come into this a little bit. In, in chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, there's mention of a place called Sheol. Actually, Bethany read from Psalm, a psalm this morning that mentioned Sheol as well. Sheol is a term that's used to describe the afterlife in the Old Testament. One Bible scholar describes it like this. In the Bible, death is never termination, but a change of place and of state with continuity of personal identity. Sheol is the place where all the dead live. It's not, a, but it's not a positive place. And what we see in chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, is that, that everyone who goes to Sheol, even the kings, are welcomed in the same way. In other words, everyone is brought low. In the psalm that Bethany read, it was a word of hope to be restored out of Sheol. Let's look briefly at Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. 
Here, the leader of Babylon is called out for seeking selfish ambition to such a degree that they wanted to be, that he wanted to be like a god. There's some possible confusion about these verses, and I want to address it a little bit. Uh, these verses are sometimes used to make some claims about Satan's fall from heaven. Uh, we don't have, uh, we, we, I don't want to spend a long time on this, but I just want to briefly address it because um, it does, um, it's a commonly uh, thing, commonly thought thing, and even appears in some translations of the Bible. So older translations of the Bible, if you have like King James Bible or the new King James Bible, it will say, uh, it'll say this, oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. Um, in, in my preaching, we've been using the ESV, and it says this, how, how you are fallen from heaven, O oh, day star, son of dawn. Literally, uh, this means day star or morning star. Um, Lucifer was the Latin and it got kind of confused for a proper name. And that's why it became um, translated that way. And so, kind of, yeah, anyway. Um, so a better translation is day star or morning star um, rather than Lucifer. So some people do think this passage describes Satan's fall from heaven, but there's really not any evidence for this. The passage is focused on the Babylonian ruler and not on Satan. Now, this does not mean, this does not reduce the threat of Satan in the world. The Bible testifies to the reality of Satan, um, but it also testifies to the reality of human evil. And that is what this passage is focused on, human evil, certainly in concert with the evil from Satan. But this leads us to consider Babylon in our world today. Babylon in our world today. So as said, Babylon um, here represents judgment on all the nations. So when it begins with Babylon and goes to all these other nations, Babylon sort of standing in for all of the nations. And so as we saw the way Babylon is used... Babylon can actually represent us today. So let's look at chapter 13, verse 11, briefly. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Is there evil in the world today? I mean, we would not have any need for the police if there was not, or we wouldn't have any locks on our doors if there was no evil. Babylon was marked by arrogance, sin, leaders who used people for their own advantage. Think about our cities today. Are these things common? They are. Think about any city around the world and it is a common feature of it. Think about your workplace or your school, and it is common. I hate to say it, but arrogance and sin and using people for your own advantage, it's everywhere. Every city is another Babylon. And as such comes under the judgment that falls on Babylon. Now, let me, let me be clear. I love cities. And I, this is not an anti-city statement. It's, it's actually an anti-human statement. I don't know if that makes it better. <laughs> but if we said, you know, like, oh, the city is terrible. We're all going to move to the jungle and set up a new society there. Guess what? You're going to have the same problems. Because humans carry the same problems with them. So every city is another Babylon. To let Babylon continue in this path of evil, of pride unchecked, of bullying the weak, 
it would be an act of cruelty. If God did not judge what was wrong in the world, what kind of God would he be? Verse 6 warns us that the day of the Lord is near. Both chapters, 13 and 14, describe God's anger at the wickedness perpetrated by Babylon. So let's look at Babylon in us. It's, an, it's important for us to acknowledge that Babylon is not just out there. It's not just those people. Rather, Babylon is in us. It's brewing, causing more destruction. In fact, it is what Isaiah reveals. The marks of sin of Babylon are no different from the way people acted in Jerusalem and in Judah. Let's jump back to Revelation 18, warning us to separate ourselves from the ways of Babylon. It says this in verses 4 and 5, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Whether you are a Christian or not a Christian, we need to honestly examine our lives. Do we take part in the sins of our city? Someone was telling me of a pastor in another country uh, treated to Starbucks coffee. The pastor saved the cup and then put his own coffee in it day after day, still carrying around the Starbucks cup. And why? It was to show status. Now, it's a small, it's a small act, right? But it, it betrays that we have allowed kind of a worldly measure to be part of who we are as God's people. It means that we are no longer seeing ourselves as valuable as God's children, but we see our value by what others think about us. We're playing Babylon's game. That's just one example. We do it in so many other ways. We have Babylon thinking going on in our minds, and it is the opposite of godly thinking. The day of the Lord is near, says Isaiah. And this spells judgment for the guilty. But it's not all bad news. For those who seek God, who humble themselves before God, who we can take comfort that God is going to battle against injustice and evil. Isaiah 13 verse 4 says this, The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. Praise God. God is not sitting back and letting everything go to rot. God is taking action. And so where do we find refuge? This is the beautiful thing about God's word. Even passages that seem difficult, like this one, it portrays God as one ready to do battle against evil and against those who bring destruction to this world. This is who God is. You might be wondering, well, then why doesn't God do this immediately? It's because we still have Babylon in our hearts. We must flee Babylon and seek God. Towards the end of Isaiah chapter 14, there are two short oracles against Assyria and then Philistia. At the very end, we see a thread of hope that judgment is coming and it will be final. But our hope, our only hope, is to come before God to seek refuge. Isaiah says this, what will one answer the messengers of the nation? The Lord has founded Zion and in her, the afflicted of his people find refuge. 
this word refuge in this verse. It literally means like a place of safety. It is where we get the word refugee. A refugee is by definition, one who is fleeing their country of origin for fear of death or severe harm. A refugee seeks refuge to be saved from a threat to their life. God has created refuge for the afflicted, but not in a way that we might expect. God did not create a rival Babylon that was just more powerful. No, that would be using the same corrupted elements that are so destructive to our lives today. Rather, God sent his own son to enter into our corrupt world. He would live in the world, but not bow to the pride and greed and selfishness that tears our lives apart. And he was afflicted because he took our affliction to his death. But death could not hold the son of God. Jesus came back to life. And we think about the refugee journey It's not that safe. Some of you have experienced this firsthand. But God, through Jesus, he brought refuge to us. We do not have to reach any certain border because the world is the Lord's and everything in it. Jesus offers refuge because he is the rightful king. Within us, he can transform us so that we no longer remain in Babylon. Take, just for example, pride. When the world relies on pride to assert ourselves, to get ahead, to get an edge on others. But when we, get, when we experience transformation in Christ, we know that Christ is without comparison. That trying to value myself higher than others is meaningless. It's useless. It's folly. That my identity is best when my identity is in Christ. We serve the true king with joy. So three things to think about this week. First, Babylon is very much a reality today, as it was in Isaiah's time. As we read passages like this one, we should begin to recognize the signs of Babylon today, here in KL or wherever we may be. Focus on power, selfish ambition, abuse of position, greed, pride, the list goes on. And yet the day of the Lord is near. God is the righteous judge. As creator and king, he rightfully wants to remove evil and those who do evil from the world. The problem is evil begins in the hearts of each of us, which means we come under judgment. The third point is this. God has established his uh, his kingdom through Jesus. And therefore, through Jesus, we are delivered from his judgment. It's not a kingdom with physical boundaries. You can't drive there, fly there. There's not an airport that I know of. That would be kind of cool, though. Kingdom airport. I don't know what that would look like, but rather, his kingdom begins in our heart. When we repent of what is in our hearts and seek refuge in Jesus, we go from Babylon to Zion, where there is life and life everlasting. Will you pray pray with me? Father, we, um, we thank you for your word, even those passages that are difficult. We ask that you would guide our reading of it. But Father, that we would not just read it ceremonially or ritually or an act to try to 
to gain favor from you, but rather that you would give us understanding so that we might know better who you are, that we might know better that you are just and you are holy and that you abide no evil. Father, we ask that as we read these passages, that you would also continuously remind us of your goodness and how you delivered us through Jesus. So Father, I pray for everyone here, whether, uh, whether we know Jesus or whether that has not yet happened. Father, I pray that you would bring us to the feet of Jesus, that you would give us a just a real understanding of what's going on in our hearts and how that we can in everyday life really see through the emptiness of Babylonian thinking and that we might live in joy in, the, in your kingdom, in life in Christ. So Father, it's um, in all of this that we, we thank you and praise you for your grace through Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.